This week on Around Texas, we visit a wildlife sanctuary that doubles as a laboratory for the Texas A&M School of Veterinary Medicine. And we meet one graduate of their program that used her experience with exotic animals to become a performer at the Dallas Zoo. We also go behind the scenes on a docuseries film set and discover how a professor of humanities at the Texas A&M Medical School is using history and the health conditions of famous Texans to teach health and to reveal transcendent lessons about humanity. All that and more on this episode of Around Texas. Everything is bigger in Texas, and the Texas A&M University system is no exception. With 11 universities and eight state agencies, the people of Texas A&M are serving more Texans and making a bigger difference than ever before. These are the educators, researchers, emergency responders, and public servants of the Texas A&M University system. Learn how their work is impacting both Texas and the world. Welcome to Around Texas with Chancellor John Sharp. The Winnie Carter Wildlife Center is a hidden gem on Texas A&M University's campus. While it's often used to help train veterinary students, it's also a sanctuary for exotic wildlife, and it was the unlikely stepping stone for one Aggie, Mary Kate Walker, who went from student assistant at the Wildlife Center to show performer and animal specialist at the Dallas Zoo. Aggieland's best kept secret. I didn't even know that it was at my university until about junior year of college. I remember being really annoyed because I had grown up there for the last decade of my life and knew a lot of things about A&M and this one big thing that was such a big part of my life that I, I didn't know about this already. We just love getting students like Mary Kate that have a great personality. They contribute greatly to animal care. They love working with animals. So people like that are just fun to be around in addition to them learning and us learning from them and them contributing to our program. There's definitely not another facility like this in the state, and I have not found another facility that's exactly like this in the United States at any university. So that, that's one of the things that I think makes us really special is that students don't have to leave campus to come here and get this experiential learning. It's a very rare and unique thing that I'm grateful for, you know, of all the things that I expected to get out of A&M. I knew the traditions and I knew the Aggie spirit and the Aggie network and the friendships, but Wildlife Center was one of the big surprises and uh, best surprises that I had in college. That really was one of the biggest things that shaped me and what I am now at the Dallas Zoo. The Winnie Carter Wildlife Center is a branch of the Texas A&M School of Veterinary Medicine that takes in rescued or retired animals, giving them a comfortable home and allows students to be educated on their management, handling, behavior, and care. While this usually benefits students wanting to become veterinarians, it also served as the perfect stepping stone for one talented Aggie, hoping to live out her dream as a performer and zoologist. I started off very young, uh, having a passion for animals. I lived in New York for the first 11 years of my life, and I used to go to the zoo schools, the summer camps that they had there. Grew up loving it, just wanting to be a part of that. Maybe all zookeepers say this. I, I feel like I had a sort of understanding about animals at an early age, reading sort of their behavior and just reading those signs. I just felt really attuned to kind of what they were feeling and how to care for them. I've been really empathetic towards them. It was always a really big part of my life growing up. Both my parents were Aggies. So when I grew up in New York, I always wanted to go to a and I had wanted to be a vet for a very long time and you are gonna be a vet. That's, you can go to A&M, that's a, kind of a general understanding. Even people in the Northeast kind of know that as well. And then when we moved to Texas, living in Aggieland, really, I would go to Midnight Yell. I would go to football games with my family and just being in that environment, being surrounded by that tradition made me actually want to go to A&M, not just because my parents went there, but because I wanted to go there. 
Once enrolled at Texas A&M, Mary Kate stumbled upon the Wildlife Center and quickly recognized Dr. Blue as being one of the most passionate and knowledgeable faculty members on campus and at a rare on-campus animal sanctuary that combined all of Mary Kate's interests. The main purpose of the Wildlife Center is to provide high impact experiential learning for our undergraduate students, professional students, and some graduate students as well. So the students come here and they participate in the daily care of our animals and we have a high expectation. The students help with any medical procedures. They help monitor animals and just make sure that they're eating right, do they look okay? And then students will also help with any sort of research projects. We love having students that take the initiative to do things with animals. We like students that want to have a career working with animals in some capacity. About 70% of our students want to go to vet school. And so we are big training ground for future veterinarians. But Mary Kate clearly wanted to have a job working with animals directly, such as a zookeeper. And the Wildlife Center was perfect for MK, since they not only housed the same exotic animals you'd find at a zoo, but many of them are actually animals that retired from zoos. So it was no surprise when Mary Kate continued volunteering with Dr. Blue, even after she had graduated. She's one of those students where she's delightful, she has a great work ethic, she was always really fun and good with the animals. We love having students like that. First impression of Dr. Blue, a little bit, little bit chaotic in the best way though. She never misses a moment to tell you what's going on. She knows what she wants, she knows what needs to be done, she knows what's best for the animals. It really kind of forces the students to step up, which I really appreciated. And while Dr. Blue and the Winnie Carter Wildlife Center were certainly the largest influences on Mary Kate's success, there are some aspects to performing at a venue like the Dallas Zoo that simply isn't taught at the vet school. For that, Mary Kate had to source her inspiration elsewhere. Entertainment is definitely part of it. You know, the zoo is here to, to educate for sure, and you know, the animals aren't here for your entertainment, but I am. There's no point in getting up and talking about ways that people can create a better world for animals if nobody's going to listen. There you are. Hi there. Getting up in front of people and talking is not something I'm a stranger to necessarily. I've done improv for a lot of years in my life, a lot of improvisational theater, Brazos Valley Troupe in Bryan College Station. So I'm no stranger to making a fool of myself on stage. <laughs> improv is not an easy task. It's not. It's bold. We want to give young people a chance to grow, whether it be on stage or off. All the components that make up what the arts presentation is all about. It's cool to see Mary Kate and others out there thriving in their element because they've taken what they've learned and they're applying it in their setting. You know, and she's one of the first ones, if not the only one, that's using it in a zoo setting, which is cool. I, I don't really think I ever expected that time at a community theater would prove very useful for an animal science field, but my time doing improv, though, I feel like has been crucial to just reacting to everything. You've got to be able to turn on a dime, not just in working with that animal, but in being on stage, too, and knowing how to interpret what's going on, um, knowing how to answer any question a guest may throw at you, because there's always something new that I'm asked. Yeah, and I know a lot about a lot of animals, but I don't know everything about every animal. No day at a zoo is the same. Mary Kate was the type of student that we like to keep here forever. She knew she wanted to end up at a zoo somewhere, and they were lucky to have her. And it's one of the best things that a student could do, is go to a place where you want to be, volunteer your time, and you get to learn about the place where you want to go. And they get to learn about you, and they get to learn, you know, about your personality and your attention to detail. So she was so happy to get a permanent job at the Dallas Zoo. These animals are worth caring for. Some of those animals, I get a lot of hate, you know? Like, I love getting to talk to people about that. I love getting to show them, like, hey, these animals that you might think are creepy crawly are actually really important, and here's why, and here's what you can do about it. And that's all kind of part of one of the things that attracted me to this zoo specifically. Their mission is engaging people and saving wildlife, and that's what I'm doing every day. I'm doing <laughs> what I can to engage people and encourage them to save wildlife and help bring their vision of creating a better world for animals to a reality, and that's, what I've been wanting to do since I was a kid. So, and I get to do it as an adult now too.
We're here with Dr. Alice Blue McClendon, who is director of the Winnie Carter Wildlife Center on Texas A&M University campus. Wildlife Center is such a unique asset for Texas A&M. Where is it? What is its focus? Tell us all about it. Well, thanks for having me. The Wildlife Center is part of the vet school, and we are on F and B Road. So we're just up from the aviary, the Shubat aviary, and we're 12 acres of fabulousness where students can come and learn about non-domestic animals. We have exotic animals and wildlife. Do you have just regular wildlife like deer and things like that or just exotic animals? Tell us what's in there. Well, we have white-tailed deer and we have a really unique population because we produced the world's first cloned white-tailed deer about 18 years ago. His name was Dewey, named after Dr. Dewey Kramer. And he was cloned from skin cells that were taken from a deer that was hunted in South Texas. And, um, you know, the procedures that require cloning where you have to take an egg from another deer were done and produced this fabulous animal that had great antlers. He lived to be about 15 years of age and he has produced lots of progeny at the Wildlife Center. Mm. And so we keep a, a pretty closed colony of white-tailed deer. We keep the boys separate from the girls so that we control the populations. Well, you have here today a couple of kangaroos. We did. We brought our, our kangaroo joeys. We have one joey. His name is Murdoch, and he's blind. And so we brought uh, our blind kangaroo who came from a local zoo, and we agreed to take him in. What would it cost to get Murdoch a, an operation to make him not blind anymore? Well, Murdoch needs very specialized veterinary surgery, and we do have two excellent veterinary ophthalmologist at the teaching hospital, but they need this specialized piece of equipment to do vitreo-retinal surgery. Um, it probably cost at least $10,000 to take him somewhere to get the specialized surgery. So this is the non-blind uh, kangaroo. This is Diego. And I decided that when you make a commitment to take in an animal that is disabled and may potentially be blind or visually impaired his whole life, I decided he should have a friend that's approximately the same age to help show him where everything is. So Diego, once they're introduced outside, he's gonna wear a collar that has bells on it so that Murdoch can find him. I'm hoping that'll work. Right. We're doing a couple little things where, uh, in the area where they are now, where we put food and water, we make that a different surface so that Murdoch can learn that food and water is in a surface different than where he's just hanging out. So how big was Murdoch when he was born? Kangaroos, marsupials are so interesting. He was probably less than two inches long and they crawl out of the birth canal and they go attached to a teat and they stay there for months. People don't even know if kangaroos are pregnant. And so what you have to do is see if there's a bulge in the pouch. And then eventually you get to see a cute head like this pop out of the pouch. And then they, they say that when kangaroos are confident enough to come out of the pouch and just go and graze on their own, that they're about six months of age. So when you choose to hand raise one, you, you do have to have an artificial pouch. And so this is his little artificial pouch. And would he hop around like a kangaroo or is he too You know, young? I think he might just hop around like a kangaroo. Shall we try it? Yeah. He does need an Aggie pouch, and we know this. <laughs> and diapers even. fabric. Dr. Alice Blue McClendon, thank you for what you do and for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. We're Texas A&M International University. We achieve. We explore. We innovate. We lead. We give, and then we give some more. We're Texas A&M International University. We're dust devils, and we go beyond. Since its charter class, the Texas A&M School of Medicine established itself as one of the most distinguished medical schools in the country. So we decided to join Dr. Mark Cecilio a graduate of the charter class and an instructor for the humanities and medicine as he transforms an elective course into a documentary series about history, medicine, and the lessons from our past. Yeah. Uh, this, this is a key light, obviously, so we'll that. 
shadows here. When I was growing up, we talked about history and politics and religion at the kitchen table. So you're over here, you'll be sitting here. I grew up in College Station. I grew up going to church with Earl and Margaret Rudder. I walked across Texas Avenue to go to Texas A&M University. Uh, this university and all that it can do for humankind means the world to me and so I hope we can help inspire others. All right, we are rolling, and we're ready to start whenever you want. Here we go. Well, thank you. As they say, only Rudder could have transformed a and How was that for your dad? Well, I think dad just saw the handwriting on the wall that a and to flourish was gonna have to change, and he started, of course, changing the course. Dr. Mark Cecilio is a professor for the Texas A&M School of Medicine. He was a member of the charter class for A&M's medical school, and he was featured as a Texas Monthly Super Doctor for his work as a pediatrician. But throughout his life, Dr. Cecilio has always had a profound interest in the humanities. The founding dean, he said, we must have humanities in the curriculum. And as it turns out, it's now in many, many medical schools across the nation and world. Because folks know that you need to tie it all in. There are scientists that are brilliant, but if they can't relate to people, if they can't communicate with people, if they can't understand the past, but also be great practitioners, uh, so that the past informs the present and changes the future for good. So we try to learn from that. Howdy, I'm Mark Cecilio. I'm a pediatrician and a faculty member at the Texas A&M University School of Medicine. And it's my privilege to welcome you all to Oak Hill, the family farm. The money pit is what I call it. Uh, it's the plantation home that the Baker family had uh, built in 1948. As it turns out, Majority Leader Lyndon Johnson, Governor John Conley, and uh, Sam Rayburn sat right where we're talking, apparently drank whiskey. Of course, for Aggies, Dean Kyle of Kyle Field was here. And then our family knew and loved the Rudders very much, and Margaret Rudder uh, was here. So we have tried to make it look like the 1840s and uh, try to share it as often as folks are interested in. Beyond his extensive collection of antiques, Dr. Cecilio is also an avid reader of history, and he began taking an interest, specifically, in the health of famous Texans. I'm an historian in that I've read, and over the last decade at the medical school, I read on the lives and health of famous Texans, because we're a great state, but also Americans, and um, it's just fascinating. Mark Cecilio, okay, I've known Mark Cecilio since our first days of medical school, which, um, you know, I think he and I both were about 19 years old when that started. Mark loves history. Um, he, he, he loves medical history and he loves American history and he really loves Texas history. So he started assembling uh, this 10 hour program to where he could teach the medical students about the health issues of famous Americans and Texans. And his lecture series was a success. Not only did it become one of the most popular elective courses at the medical school, but it also provided an engaging medium for students to study pervasive diseases and the history of medicine. We've all heard the old saying, if you don't know your history, you're destined to repeat it, right? And one of the ways you encourage folks into, you know, looking into the history of medicine is by giving them something interesting and then they continue to look, all right? So if we could get them into uh, an elective where we're talking about, maybe first it's like all of the presidents, for example. Um, what were their health issues? Then, well, number one, it makes you interested in science. But the other thing that happens is it's a way of learning about the illnesses and the syndromes that the students are gonna see when they're physicians. 
So, you know, if you learn about John F. Kennedy's Addison's disease and the symptoms he had, you never forget that. So it started out with a handful of the most prominent uh, Americans in their history. And then because of interest in, from the students and from Dr. Watson and from the college, it has grown and it's up to 750 slides now. But it, it'll never be done because there are always pearls of history that we can use to help others. With the lecture at over 700 slides and Dr. Cecilio's research expanding, he and Dr. Watson began to question if this well of knowledge could be shared with a larger audience. We have this popular course and it dawned on me that it might be better in some other format, you know, because he doesn't like to write a book. What he likes to do is talk to people and teach them. And so that's when he thought, well, maybe I could do it with the local station. Maybe I could put this into that kind of format. After the concept for a TV show was approved, Dr. Cecilio initiated the first step in TV production, filming and producing a pilot episode. How are we starting this? Because you know, being around me, I do need direction because I love all of these things. But here at Texas A&M, it's so easy to talk about Earl Rudder and his life and his health. For example, Earl Rudder climbed the 100-foot cliffs at Point de Hoc on D-Day, the toughest assignment of the war. But he did that. And when they were gonna build that Rudder Tower, they all agreed 12 floors, 12 men, and 100 feet high, as high as Point de Hoc. So when you look at the outside, it's the chipped concrete, which mimics that cliff. And Aggies should know that and be inspired to strive for excellence, just as he and his American Rangers did. And so in the show's first season, Dr. Cecilio plans on featuring several prominent Aggies, along with their health and humanity, to inspire Texans, Americans, and people all over the world to strive for that same level of excellence. We need to record what could be shared with the public so that they could learn these snippets from history and be inspired to go help others. That's what it's about. Mark Cecilio loves doing medicine, loves doing pediatrics, and so he's out there doing that and also making a difference. Because uh, ultimately, you know, you don't have a university, you don't have a college, if, unless your intent is to make a difference. Uh, so we see that as an important, important part of our job. We're here with Dr. Mark Cecilio, who is the a pediatrician at the Health Science Center, and his knowledge of history on famous Americans is unmatched in the HSC, probably unmatched maybe in Texas. Uh, what sparked all of this interest uh, in Aggie history in particular? As one growing up in College Station, A&M was all there was in the 60s. And so Papa, who was a chemistry professor, encouraged us to study science, but also important things. So we read biographies instead of fiction. And uh, it just became a, an interest of mine. So I continued to read over the past 50 years about famous Texans and famous Americans. And then as a pediatrician, how health impacted their lives and their decisions. And uh, there were very profound influences, for example, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was very sick with asthma, he, and instead of being confined to the home like he could have been as a very wealthy American, he chose to exercise hard, do his father's exercises. There were no medicines for it back then. And then he rose above that. And on Valentine's Day, both his mom and his wife died one year. That was devastating. And instead of giving in to the depression that followed, he went out west and he saw the beauty of America and he became a big advocate for preservation of that beauty for the American people. So how health impacts 
all of us and then those that we view often as leaders as they rise above that. And that's what's of interest to me. And it's like the, you talking about famous people. There's an old saying that George Washington never smiled. What's that about? You're, you're absolutely right. He had one tooth when they fitted him with dentures and they were not made of wood. It's, we, we cannot tell a lie about George Washington. His dentures were not wood, though they looked like wood because he liked port wine, which stained them. So they were made of hippopotamus bone and even a human tooth and uh, gold and lead. Lead is not good for the human brain, but he had that in his dentures. And because it stretched him and they fit so uncomfortably, he never smiled. The, those in the cabinet would look at him and note that even at times of laughter, when everyone else was joyous, he, he would not smile. So the dollar bill, when you look at it, he's not smiling. And uh, in that great portrait in the East Room, he's not smiling either. So that's absolutely right, Chancellor. So how did you accumulate all this information on people like that? Well, I was asked to teach Aggie medical students and they're really smart. And so I had to prepare for them. So that's how that was developed. Dr. Mark Cecilio with the Texas A&M Health Science Center. Thank you, Chancellor Sharp. My name is Sydney Montana Hernandez. I graduated from Texas A&M University, Kingsville in 2015, where I studied mass communications, journalism, and political science. And I'm currently the evening news anchor here at KBO TV. Texas A&M Kingsville runs in my family. I bleed blue and gold. I'm so proud to be a Havelina. I have so many family members that went to A&M Kingsville. When it was my turn, I had no doubt I was going to be a hoggy. I've been here now back in the Valley for five years now in the TV industry and I'm so proud because these are my people. This is my home. These are my teachers that watch me, my family members, and now I'm here giving them the news that they see every night. Growing up here in the Rio Grande Valley, there's a lot of poverty in our area. There's a lot of people that don't know where to turn and I want it to be that middleman to bring them answers. We stand in, we fight for them, we bring them answers, and at the end of the day, the problem gets resolved. To be able to be here in my hometown reporting the news is everything to me. And I hope to inspire other young Hispanic women that want to go in this field. I encourage them, go chase those dreams. Go do it. At a &M Kingsville, I felt like a person, not just a number. The student-teacher ratio was so small, I was able to connect with my professors on a personal level, and that's why I'm the journalist I am today, because we had that personal relationship and I learned extensively. That's it for this week's show. We'll see you next week on Around Texas.